All right, hello and welcome to Disability Law Show once again. John Scholes, your host, and alongside co-founding partners, uh, Firu Tamarkin, LLP. Savan Tamarkin here, uh, the most positively reviewed employment, uh, pardon me, well, employment and disability law firm there is across the country. You want to Google that and check it out from coast to coast to coast. I tell you the truth, that's exactly how it is. 1-855-821-5900. That's the phone number anytime to reach out to Savan. Help at disabilityrights.ca. Ton of stuff to get through today, including three myths about total disability and long-term disability claims. That is coming up in just a bit, but Savan, we always start every show with, uh, I guess we're still calling it the week that was, or something that's happened on, on your end of the desk uh, recently, pal. How are you? I'm good, John. It's good. great to be back. And, uh, you know, it, it's, been, uh, it's been a crazy time, you know, with COVID and everything yeah. else that is going on. Uh, you're right. We do employment law. We do disability law. We do those two areas of law uh, in, in three provinces in Canada, in Ontario, in BC, and Alberta. And we help people all over these provinces deal with their employment issues and their disability issues, long-term disability, dealing with, uh, with their insurance companies. Let me tell you about uh, one case that, that was resolved very, very recently, which is indicative of the kind of cases that we deal with at our offices uh, and this had to do with a 57 year old man uh, father of two two kids under 10 uh, this gentleman is a mechanical engineer and uh, he started experiencing back pains a few years back and those became gradually worse and worse and at some point he was diagnosed with a, a chronic pain condition uh, fibromyalgia chronic back pain etc he has wow. a chronic pain doctor he has a family doctor and of course as a result of that that affects your mood it affects your sleep so he's suffering from depression, anxiety, etc. It got to the point where he simply was unable to work as a result of these pains and everything that he was experiencing, you know, psychologically as well. And so he had coverage, short-term and long-term disability coverage through work, through his health benefits. And so he applies for short-term disability and gets it for a few months. And then comes the time to switch over to long-term disability. And again, he gets the necessary paperwork mm -hmm. from his doctors, uh, you know, uh, 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 applies, and he gets denied. And he gets denied on the basis of insufficient medical support for disability, for showing that he's disabled from working. And what does he do? What most people do, you know, when you get that letter, at the end of that letter, denying your claim, you're invited to appeal what? that decision. And so he appeals it in good faith, just like most people. And he appeals it once, gets denied after a few months appeals us a second time, again gets denied, and then just stops, doesn't do anything about this. This was about a year and a half ago, okay, when he was denied uh, these, these uh, uh, applications. And at some point, somebody told him about us, and so he saw some of our shows on TV, and uh, he, he uh, uh, heard us on the radio, came to us, and I spoke with him. I remember speaking with him for over an hour, with him and his wife, mm -hmm. and I reviewed all the medical documentation, and you know, it was so clear-cut what the insurance company was doing here. It was so clear-cut that they were simply denying for no reason, no good reason. And so I got involved. We resolved this case now within a matter of weeks since we got involved, since I communicated with the insurance company, I got a call from the defense lawyer of the insurance company saying, Sivan, there must have been an error initially in the handling of the claim. We would like to resolve it in good faith. And so what they did is they basically put him uh, on claim. They paid him retroactively everything he was owed since he was denied. Now, not every claim resolves this way, but I can tell you, John, time and time again, people come to us when they're denied long-term disability. We get involved, partly because of our name. Our firm is just well known in the disability industry with insurance companies, and partly because it's no nonsense for us. We understand how these insurance companies operate. We understand that most of these denials are nonsense. And we go after the insurance company and we force them to pay. And they pay. And the worst thing people can do out there is walk away from their rights and walk away from the money that's owed to them when they are legitimately disabled from working. So if that's going to happen, say that's a, ser a scenario that's very common for you guys, and you're going to circle back and they're going to come, oh, you know what, there must be an oversight, sorry, the wrong claim. Why do they waste time doing that? Why do these appeals all the time? Because it's just going to end up back in their desk anyway. You know, John, it's a good question. And one of the things we've always been saying to people is don't appeal these long-term nope. disability denials. Just contact us. This is what we do. We deal with insurance companies. It's our bread and butter. And by the way, sometimes you don't need us. Sometimes we'll give you advice. And when we speak with people, when they contact us, it's always for free. We don't charge anything for any of this advice that we give. That's why we do these shows on the radio, on TV. It's to give this information to empower people. Why do insurance companies do it? Very, very simple reason. They do it because at the end of the day, most people will walk away from the money that's owed to them. The insurance companies are going to pocket that money, and that's how they get those billions of dollars in profits 
that they give their shareholders, their boards of directors, etc. And you know what? D don't. This is my messaging for anybody out there. It may be not be you. It may be a family member, a friend, a colleague. Please just direct them to our website just so they can get the information they need. They may not want to contact us. They may still wish to, to you know, accept the insurance company's denial and walk away from their money, but at least they'll be empowered and they'll know what their rights are. Again, disabilityrights.ca anytime and the phone number 1-855-821-5900. That appeal process, is it a must-do? Is it, is it orchestrated by someone outside the insurance company? Because it all sounds very official, right? Yes, it does. No, it's not. It's not a must do, absolutely not. And it does sound official. It sounds like there is this third party mechanism, maybe right. a judge or an ombudsperson that takes a look at this uh, appeal. No, you're appealing to the exact same people who denied you in the first place. Maybe their colleagues, you know, in the next cubicle. That's it. You're not getting, you know, a fresh pair of eyes necessarily. You're not getting people who are looking at this with the intent of helping you. You are looking at this, you are appealing to the same company whose interest it is to deny your claim because if they pay you, it's less money in their pocket. Right. So no, you don't have to appeal it. There's a much more powerful route. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and this is the route that we deal with. It's the legal route and it's not painful and it's not long. It's not a long process. Forget about everything you see on TV, okay? You're not going to end up in court. You're not going to end up in this huge litigation. These insurance companies are simply banking on people mm -hmm. walking away. As soon as you stand up for your rights or you let us help you stand up for your rights, they fold. They fold and they pay. We kind of alluded at the start of the show there's a lot of crossover between the employment law and the disability law, which, which your firm does both. And there's a, a really cool website. It's been out for a couple of years, really handy, free anonymous called pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. The word employment is there, but there's a pretty robust section for you as well when it comes to disability, right? They can Absolutely. Use. So it is a free website. Exactly. John is correct. Uh, and yeah, there is a crossover because many people who are experiencing employment issues are experiencing them because they're disabled. They may not know that they're disabled. It may be something, a condition that evolves over time and then they know that they need to apply for the insurance company coverage. But some people, you know, they're having issues with their long-term disability insurer and at the same time, they get let go by their employer. So that's why the pocket employment lawyer deals with both areas. And, you know, we, des we designed that website for people who don't want to call us. We don't want to speak to a lawyer or communicate with us for whatever reason. I mean, we're not nice guys, but some people just want to get their own information. Fine. Go to Pocket Employment Lawyer and you will see there is a section there that deals just with long-term disability where you input your information and you will get fast and accurate answers about your specific situation. Another contact, of course, is help at disabilityrights.ca, that email address for you anytime. We, uh, we, we handpick some and we always talk about them on the show here. We'll get to the first one for today. So then this one comes from uh, Bev, says, my sister has been harassed at work for being a practicing Muslim. Last year it got so bad that she had to go on leave because of depression. The insurance company denied her LTD application, but we don't understand why. Her family doctor and psychologist both wrote letters saying that she needs time off to heal. Uh, should she try to return if she's not ready? She has two young kids and her husband is away from work for most of the year. Wow. Yeah, this is, uh, again, unfortunately not something that is that uncommon. Uh, absolutely, Bev, your sister should not be going to work if she's not ready to go back to work. I always tell people, irrespective of the legalities, listen to your doctors. If you go to a psychologist or a family doctor or any other specialist and they'll tell you, don't go to work because of X and Y and Z, you need to heal. You need to undergo treatments. Do those. Now, in this case, John, her sister is being denied and she doesn't exactly know why. We're pretty good at figuring out why. I mean, these denial letters, when you get them from the insurance company, they usually spell out one, two, three, four, five reasons for why you're denied. But people know if they're disabled or not. They know if they've been wronged or not. That's why they reach out to us. In this case, it's Bev. It's the sister, which again, I applaud because sometimes people who are disabled don't have the ability or the strength to reach out to us. And so my response to Bev is this. I don't know why the insurance company denied her claim at this point. We need to look at the denial letter, but I can tell you, John, that if she has LTD coverage and if her doctors say that she's disabled from working, then she has a claim. She should not be going back to work and killing herself because the insurance company will not honor the terms of the policy. She should be standing up for her rights or letting us help her stand for her rights. So in, in, in situations like this, what we would do is we would set up a phone call. I would ask for the documentation. I want to see the denial letter the medical documents that show that the person is disabled. And then I tell them within a matter of minutes if they have a case or not. And if they do, fantastic. They can decide if to pursue it. If they don't want to pursue it, that's fine as well. We don't pressure anyone, but at least she'll know what her rights are. So Bev, please have your sister reach out. We will help her.
She has the backing of her medical team. Now, yep. is, is your doctor not the final word, the gatekeeper of your health? So if he says you cannot work, he has, he has the final word or she has the final word, right? Yes. Absolutely. And again, we're going to talk about this in, in a little bit more detail mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes insurance companies think that they're the last word. Sometimes these adjusters think that they know more than the doctors who are treating people. Sometimes there's discrepancies in the medical opinions. Again, we deal with all of these cases. At the end of the day, the analysis to me is quite simple. Is the person legitimately disabled from working? If they are and their doctors are saying that they should be off work until they recover, and they have that kind of coverage, disability coverage, they should apply and they should get it. And if they run into difficulties, this is where we step in and help. Coming up, myths about total disability and LTD claims. That is on the way, but we got to take a short break. So we'll do that now and continue on the other side. In the meantime, 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca as well. We'll continue. Disability Law Show. People think you should go to the government to get severance pay. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Should you appeal? Appeals often fail because insurance companies control the process. So long as you appeal, you're playing by their rules. You should never appeal the denial of your disability benefits. Appeals are just a mirage of false hope. Don't. That's their process. Take it out of their hands and fight for your rights with our help. Go to disabilityrights.ca. Discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think their employer can make changes to their job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. Disability Law Show. Good to have you along. So Van Tamarkin, of course, here, co-founding partner, San Firu Tamarkin, LLP. Reach out anytime you would like. Just have a simple chat. It'll cost you nothing. Give you some peace of mind as well. 1-855-821-5900. You can go to disabilityrights.ca. Put help at in front of that for help at disabilityrights.ca. Three email. As promised, Van, I want to get to this. Uh, three myths uh, about total disability and long-term disability claims. I love this first one. We talk about this all the time. And that is the term total disability means that you are catastrophically disabled. You're done. Right? John, we can do a show exclusively <laughs> devoted to this term. Here's the sure. thing. Let's go back to basics because we may have some viewers that it's their first time seeing the yep. show. Under the majority of long-term disability policies, in order to qualify or to be eligible to receive LTD, long-term disability payments, you have to demonstrate medically with the help of your doctors, writing letters for you, yep. that you are totally disabled from performing the essential tasks of your own occupation for the first two years, right. and then there's a, another test after the two-year mark. But total disability, totally disabled, is that phrase that those two words are being thrown out there. And John, when I tell you, when I tell anyone, my wife, you know, whoever, you have to be totally disabled uh, before you get LTD, they think to themselves what most normal people would think, which is it's catastrophic. Mm -hmm. It's, you have to have a brain injury. You have to have amputation of, of, of you know, all your limbs. You have to right. be in bed. No, it's none of that. It is none of that. This phrase was developed and created by the insurance industry, in my opinion, to mislead the public. Why to mislead? Because when you say total disability, you think 100%. Yeah, I'm not that's that. Not, yeah. Exactly. That's not it. It's not it. Total disability in LTD terminology basically means that you cannot perform the essential tasks of your own occupation for the first two years or the essential tasks of any occupation for which you're suited for beyond the two-year mark. Okay? It doesn't mean you're in bed. doesn't mean you can't get groceries. doesn't mean you can't pick up your kids from school. doesn't mean any of that. It just means that you cannot perform the essential tasks of your occupation or any occupation for which you're suited for. So you can be depressed, very, very depressed, suffer from severe anxiety. A and it doesn't mean that you can't pick up your kids from school. It just means that you can't perform the essential tasks of your occupation. So my point is that most people out there who are getting denied because they're told you're not totally disabled and they think to themselves, yeah, I'm not totally disabled. It's not what you think it is. If you cannot work, period, because of your disability, then you should qualify for long-term disability. And if you have any questions about that, you give us a call, you email us. We'll tell you. It's not difficult. We speak to people, hundreds of people, literally every day for free. 
and we give them this information. So there should be no ambiguity about this. We often dust off the, the, you know, the classic example of if you're a concert pianist and that's mm -hmm. how you make your living and you burn both hands on a cast iron pot severely, for all intents and purposes, according to this, you would be totally disabled because you can't do yep. your job, right? A hundred percent. Or, you know, you're, you're a violinist or you're sure. a plastic surgeon or whatever it is and you hurt your pinky finger and now you can't operate or now you can't, you know, play the violin. You are totally disabled for the purposes of the policy. You're not totally disabled in the in common sense in life, but that's not what's the what the requirement yeah. is. But it confuses people and it confuses doctors because doctors look at this term and say, "Yeah, but my patient is not. They can't work, but they're not totally disabled." Right. You know, so so we 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 make sure that people understand the difference here and that this is a specific term for long-term disability policies. It's not to be used the way you and I use it in just layman's terms. You know, in everyday life. Myth number two is this, only the insurance company can decide if you are totally disabled under your LTD policy. Well, that's what they want you to think. Okay. <laughs> they want you to think that they have the last word. No, absolutely not. It's not only them. In fact, I would say that it's you as the individual who's disabled and it's your doctors or whoever it is that is treating you. Could be a psychologist, psychotherapist, psychiatrist, orthopedic surgeon, chronic pain doctor. It can be anyone that is treating you who has come to the opinion as your treatment provider that you are disabled from working. And if they've come to that opinion, then the onus shift on the insurance company to explain why they're denying, why they're not accepting that opinion. So no, the insurance company is not the only one. In fact, I would say that they're low on the totem pole in terms of deciding if you are totally disabled or not. It's really the people who are treating you and you yourself who know if you are disabled from working. Myth number three kind of dovetails into that one, Savannah. That is, if your LTD insurer says that you are not totally disabled, then you cannot get LTD. John, the reality is this. If that was in fact the case, I would have no work. Good many point. of my colleagues would not have any work. Many judges would have no work. It's nonsense. But again, there is an illusion out there, right? There is this idea that insurance companies are trying to propagate that they are all-knowing, all-powerful, because there are these you know, humongous entities that have unlimited power and money. That's not the case, it's just not. And I'm talking not just as somebody who goes after them for a living, as somebody also who used to work for them for a living mm. for X amount of time. You know, in my old days, many, many years ago, I used to work for insurance companies. I can tell you right now, John, they know that they are wrong in many instances, but they are playing the odds that people will walk away from their rights. They're playing the odds that people will not know any better, and they're playing the odds that most people will give up. And so the reality is, if the insurance company is telling you we're denying your claim because you're not totally disabled, that's when you spring into action. It's not when you, you know, cower down and, and go into a shell and just, you know, stop everything you're doing. No, that's when you say, wait a second, I'm going to check what my rights are. I'm not going to take this. If, in fact, that's the truth, then that's fine, I'll walk away. But I'm going to check what my rights are, and I'm not going to take my insurance adjuster's word for it. And you know, having been on that side for before working for the insurance company, you must look at a claim and go, oh, okay, this is going to go sideways for sure because this person for sure qualifies for LTD, but you've got to deny them, right? Yes. I, and, and, you know, sometimes I, I can tell you, again, without being too cynical, it's orchestrated. A lot of these adjusters know what's happening. They understand that, in fact, they're looking at claims that should absolutely be approved. And some of them don't. Some of them are very junior. Some of them you know, are handling over 100 claims at any given point. These adjusters are overworked, they're tired, they're not as detailed as perhaps they should be. And the reality is that they make mistakes. So they make mistakes and sometimes they're doing it on purpose, sometimes they're not. But again, they don't, they're not the final authority. They're not. You are the only one who can dictate if the insurance company is going to walk over you. And if you decide no, that they're not going to, and you reach out to us, you reach out to anyone on our team, we will tell you what the law is and we will tell you how the law applies to your specific case. And then you will have the power to decide what you want to do. Do you want to let them simply get away with keeping your money or do you want to actually make them pay you? Coming up here, what to do if your company shuts down and you are receiving LTD benefits. That'll cause you some stress, but we'll clear that up after a uh, short break. In the meantime, here's the number again, 1-855-821-5900 and help at disabilityrights.ca. It's a disability law show. Lots more is coming up. People think contractors aren't owed severance. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. 
they know that most people are just gonna walk away. Your insurer may ignore you, they may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks' pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back again. John Scholes, your host, and my co-host always, Savan Tamarkin, and it is uh, Sam Fury Tamarkin LLP. Reach out anytime to the most positively reviewed disability law firm in this land. You can do so a few different ways. The phone number, 1-855-821-5900, and help at disabilityrights.ca. Okay, I mentioned we've, we've thrown a few websites at you so far during the show. I'm going to throw one more at you, mydisabilityquestions.com. As it sounds, it's a place for you to go anonymously and ask your questions about LTD if, if you're not quite at the point where you want to give Savannah a phone call. You can go here, ask your questions. They will be answered very quickly by uh, Savannah, or a member of his crew, MyDisabilityQuestions.com. Savannah, an example for you. This one comes from Patricia. She says, I've been on long-term disability for a year and a half, and in another six months, the language changes to capable of doing any occupation. Unfortunately, my company closed a year ago. Will insurance cut me off if I have no job to return to, or do they have to ret uh, refrain uh, retrain me rather for a different career that's stressful yeah. very very stressful and again especially now in the era of covid it's yep. not unusual so let's break this down because there's a few things i want to touch on here number one the fact that the company closed down does not affect this person's ltd entitlements once you are on disability on long-term disability it doesn't matter what happens to your company it doesn't matter if they close down doesn't matter if they get sold it doesn't matter nothing matters from that context the only way you can stop getting long-term disability is if you're no longer disabled we're going to talk about that because this person is now yep. uh, potentially going to have to prove something else to get more LTD. Uh, or you've reached that uh, age limit. And usually on the Morse policies, it's age 65. Uh, and, and so if you're 64 years old and they tell you in a year from now we're going to end your benefits, well, that's just the term of the policy. It's just the way these things are written and what the law allows. But, you know, it's a big concern here for this person, obviously, but for Patricia, because... Uh, she's thinking to herself, wait a second, I've been on LTD for, for a year and a half. In six months, the language yep. of total disability for, for you know, my eligibility for LTD changes. So I want to talk about that for a second. Yep. We mentioned this before earlier in the show that for the first two years on LTD, to get LTD, you have to show with the help of your doctors that you cannot perform the essential tasks of your own occupation. It's called the own occupation test. Beyond the two-year mark, under most policies, most, uh, the test changes to any occupation for which you are suited for by training, education, or experience. Now, that last phrase is important because she says here, capable of doing any occupation. It's not any occupation. It's any occupation for which you are suited for. And usually we look at commensurate income. We ask at around the two-year mark of you being on LTD, can you get another position, another job, if you can't do yours, or another occupation that will pay you, let's say, 60 65% of your pre-disability income. If the answer is no, that you cannot perform another job, another occupation that will pay you that, well then you should meet the eligi eligibility criteria for LTD beyond the two-year mark. But most people get cut off around that time by the insurance company. Insurance companies are known for cutting people off around that two-year mark because what they say is to you is, we recognize you can't do your own occupation, but we think you can do something else. And sometimes they'll send you to different assessments and they'll look at your resume and they'll look at a whole bunch of different things and say, you know, John, we think you can do X, Y, and Z, those other occupations. You're no longer a prom. They cut you off. Meanwhile, you can't. Or, like Patricia, you have no employer to go to. So, you know, if that's the, the important thing here, that if you cannot, in fact, do or work in other occupation that can pay you 60, 65 percent of your predisability income, then you should continue to get LTD. Now, in this case, uh, her company closed down. Do they have an obligation to retrain her? Uh, it depends on the policy. Mm -hmm. In many policies, no, there's no such obligation. The only criteria for whether they pay you beyond the two-year mark is, are you disabled from working in any occupation for which you suit for? So it's an analysis like this, and we have to look at the policy. That's why we tell people, contact us. We don't charge anything for this. We'll look at a policy. We'll look at your situation, and we'll give you all your options. 
Now, I mean, we don't know what Patricia did for a living, but generally when they when they switch to that uh, that two year mark and it's any occupation within the boundaries of what you said, do they at least try to ballpark it? Like you're not going to go from being a plastic surgeon to a barista. We love our baristas, don't get me wrong, but they're not going to do or will they do that? Will they attempt that? Because obviously not 65 percent of your your pre. No, no, pay. they yeah, they ought to. <laughs> they, they ought to, you know, look out for you, but they don't. They are looking for every way they can to get you off the books, to stop paying you. So if they don't, if they're not able to deny your claim outright at the outset of the claim, uh, then every step of the way they're going to try and figure out when can they cut you off. And most people encounter that wall, that resistance, mm -hmm. where the adjuster telling them we think you can do something else. You know, as soon as your adjuster tells you, Send me a resume. We want to send you to uh, a, a, you know, a transferable skills assessment yeah, to figure out what other skills you As soon as you're getting the sense, like they're starting to talk about you doing something else, yeah. that should be a flag that they're starting to look to see if they can just stop paying you around that two-year mark because that's that when that change of definition date. That's when you go to your doctor if you cannot do other work and, and your work and, and you get ongoing letters. Uh, you get updated reports from your doctors saying, no, this person is still disabled, they need more time. You want to arm yourself with this. You want to protect yourself because the insurance company will cut you off if they can. I want to squeeze in Trevor's email here. Anytime for you as well, help at disabilityrights.ca. Trevor says, uh, I've started having seizures last year and it would often happen at work. The doctors I'm seeing still don't know what is causing them and they don't want me to go back to work. After applying for LTD, I was told my transition claim from short to long-term disability was denied. I'm currently in the hospital but not getting benefits. What should I do? Very, very tough situation. He's in the hospital, John, for God's sakes, and the insurance company is pulling this. I would want to speak with Trevor immediately. I want to see exactly what the, what the rationale is from the insurance company. And here's the other thing. In many instances, it's the employer that's paying short-term disability, and then the insurance company, whichever one they have, takes over and play, pays long-term disability. But oftentimes, I mean, the test for getting short-term disability and long-term are essentially the same. Mm. Are you disabled from performing the essential tasks of your occupation? And so how is it that, you know, he had what it took to have him approved for the short-term disability but not for the long-term disability? You know, those are fairly easy claims for us to resolve uh, in some cases, obviously. And, I mean, it's very nuanced and we have to look at each uh, case uh, independently. But he's experiencing seizures. We don't actually understand what is going on yet. We need to see some of the reports from his doctors. To me, this is the worst situation. He has no income coming in. He is in the hospital. He's helpless. He feels, I can't do anything. He can. He reached out. We're going to chat with him at some point after the show, right? We're going to connect with him and we're going to talk to him. The one thing he should not do is appeal that denial. Yeah. I bet you this is one of those cases that I write a letter to the insurance company, get a lawyer appointed on the other side, a defense lawyer who's going to call me up and say, Sivan, we made a mistake. I bet you that's what's going to happen here. Can't guarantee it. I don't know. We have to look at it. But I can tell you it's happened time and time again. Insurance companies understand only one language and that's force. And unless you force your rights, unless you stand up for your rights or get somebody to help you to stand up for your rights, you will not go, you know, you just won't get very far. And that's not just disability insurance. That's house insurance, car insurance. They are there to make money. They're not there to look out for you no matter all the commercials, you know, yeah. that they're putting out there about how they're going to be there when it's rainy and they're going to be your best friend. We've all seen those commercials. Trust yourself. Trust that you have that power. I'm telling you you have that power. I'm telling people out there you have that power. I used to work for insurance companies. It's all a bluff. Now, in some instances, they are correct. I can't say in every case they denied incorrectly. But at least you need someone to tell you, have they denied you incorrectly or correctly? And it's not difficult for us to figure that out and to tell you. Good stuff. Hope you learned something done for another show. Reaching out, as we've mentioned, throughout the last half hour, 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca. Shorten that down for the website, simply disabilityrights.ca. You'll find links to our long-running radio show there as well across the country. Lots of stuff going on there. And, of course, you can go to mydisabilityquestions.com. Free and anonymous. You can check that out as well. We'll catch you next time. Disability Law Show.